Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be investigating the electric field that you would get between a pair of infinitely big conducting plates that meet at an angle theta naught. So I've sketched this out um, on the screen here. Remember that this is really a three-dimensional problem, so our plates are meeting along a line, um, this line here which goes straight into the screen. And I'll also point out that we're solving this problem subject to certain boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are going to be that the potential V, electric potential V, is equal to some constant V0 on both of those conducting plates, which makes a lot of sense because conductors are always equipotentials. Now, there are a couple of different methods we could use to do this. The most direct way would be to just take Laplace's equation for the potential and solve it in polar coordinates and apply the boundary conditions and we'd have our solution. That's a perfectly good way to do it. In this video, I wanted to take a bit of an unconventional approach using complex numbers. So before watching the main bit of this video, I would suggest either make sure you know about the connection between complex numbers and Laplace's equation, um, or just watch my previous video where I talk about that. So as a starting point for this problem, I would just like to get you to consider a complex function, f of z, which is just going to be z to the power of some number k, right? And it's going to become clear a little bit later on why we're considering this particular complex function, but let's just explore some properties of this function first. And just to clarify, this z here is our generic complex variable x plus i y, where x and y are the real and imaginary parts respectively, or we could represent it in polar form, r e to the i theta, where r is the modulus and theta is the argument of z. Now in this problem, uh, the electrostatics problem that we're trying to solve, uh, we are looking for the solution for the electric field in a sort of wedge-shaped region. That kind of suggests that the natural choice of coordinates is going to be polar rather than Cartesian. And so this re to the i theta form of z is going to be more useful here. So let's take that and plug it into our function f of z. If I just raise that whole thing to the power of k, then you find that f of z is just r to the k um, times e to the i k theta. And then using the relationship between complex exponentials and trigonometric functions, we can expand out that exponential and say that it's r to the k um, times cos of k theta. And then the imaginary part would be plus um, i times r to the k and sine of k theta. So let's just note down as well that that first bit uh, is the real part of f, and that second bit, not including the i, um, is the imaginary part. Now, what we discussed last time was the fact that for any complex analytic function, both the real and imaginary parts separately satisfy Laplace's equation, del squared phi is equal to zero. And that's relevant to the electrostatics problem that we're trying to solve here, because the electrostatic potential is going to satisfy Laplace's equation um, uh, as well. And so that raises the question of, can we take either r to the k cos k theta or r to the k sine k theta and interpret one of those as a valid solution for the electric potential in this problem. And the answer basically just depends on whether we can make one of those things satisfy the appropriate boundary conditions. So let's think about the real part first. If we were to say, let's suppose that r to the k cos k theta is the electric potential in this problem, that wouldn't really work because consider what happens when theta is zero. When theta is zero, the cos of k theta bit would be one. And so your supposed electric potential would vary like r to the power of k. However, the theta equals zero surface is basically just this bottom, the horizontal uh, conducting plate, right? And the potential is supposed to be constant on that conducting plate, but r to the k is not a constant. And so we can't possibly interpret the real part of our function as a solution for the potential. What about the imaginary part? So let's write this out. I guess the fact that I'm going to write this out uh, tells you that it's probably going to work, but let's understand why that is. So suppose that the potential is the imaginary part of the function, which is, as we said, r to the k um, sine of k theta. Then what happens when theta is equal to zero? Well, sine of zero is just zero, and so the potential is zero. It's not v naught, but we can fix that later. At least it's a constant, right? That's a good start. So when theta is zero, let's write this out, the potential v is equal to a constant. That's the important thing. The constant happens to be zero, uh, and that's specifically on the surface defined by theta equals zero. 
Now to satisfy the original boundary conditions of the problem that we're trying to solve, we need the potential to be constant on the surface theta equals theta naught as well, right? Because that was our other conductor along which the potential is constant. Um, we haven't said anything about the value of k, right? This parameter k that appears in our complex function, the power that z is raised to. Um, and so we're kind of free to choose whatever k we want. And we can choose k such that an appropriate boundary condition is satisfied, right? So if we want to make um, v equals 0 uh, on the surface theta equals theta naught, we can note that, OK, sine of k theta is 0 wherever the argument of of the sine, in other words, k theta, is equal to an integer multiple of pi, right? Because sine becomes zero at zero and pi and two pi and so on. And for negative values as well, right? minus pi, minus two pi, and so on. Um, so potential is also zero wherever the condition k theta is equal to n pi is satisfied, uh, where n is any integer. And therefore, if we were to choose our value of k, such that it's equal to some integer times pi divided by theta naught, the angle between the plates, then your potential would be zero on the surface theta equals theta zero, right? Because this thing rearranges to k theta zero equals n pi, which was exactly this condition, but specifically when theta is equal to theta zero. So let's see if we can put all this together and construct some kind of general solution um, to Laplace's equation that's going to be valid for the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, we can write down that, okay, our potential V is going to be constructed basically out of this R to the K sine K theta term. Um, but remember, we've just said that K has to take on these specific values. So we can write down V is um, R to the power of N pi uh, over theta naught times sine of, again, N pi over theta naught. That has to be multiplied by theta. Um, but of course, n can be any integer, right? So we have to really do a sum over all possible values of n. Let's put a sum in front of there. And of course, we need some kind of coefficient because we are constructing a general linear combination of all the allowed solutions. Um, there's nothing to say that you can't multiply those, like each individual solution, by a constant. And so to make the most general solution, we've got to put some arbitrary coefficient. Let's call it alpha n. Um, here, and we're summing over uh, n. The one additional condition that we can impose on n, other than the fact that it's just an integer, is that it should be a positive integer. The reason for that is if n were negative, then you would have r to a negative power here, which is like 1 over r to a positive power, and therefore your potential would become infinite um, as r goes to zero. That's not a physically realistic solution. We're trying to make sure that the potential is constant, it's finite equal to v0 um, everywhere on our surface, including where r is equal to 0. And I can therefore write underneath this sum, n has to be bigger than 0. doesn't matter whether we include 0 or not, because when n is 0, this sine term becomes 0, and it's just 0 anyway. So it doesn't really matter whether we include that. And finally, we can just add on a constant at the end, so plus v0. The reason that's fine to do is because v0 itself satisfies Laplace's equation, right? In other words, uh, del squared of any constant, which here is v0, is equal to zero. So by the principle of superposition, it's fine to add on um, any constant we like. And we have to do it in this case if we want um, our potential to satisfy the appropriate boundary condition, right? So this plus v0 is the solution to that problem that I mentioned earlier, where the potential was zero, it's a constant, but it's zero, which is not v0. So we just add on a v0 to fix that. So this is a nice general solution. Um, to make this look a bit more manageable, um, for the rest of the video, let's assume that we only really care about the electric field uh, in the region close to the line along which the plates intersect. In other words, we only care about small values of R. Now, if we only care about small values of R, the dominant term in this sum uh, is going to be the n equals 1 term. In other words, the smallest possible value of n. Uh, the reason for that is if R is small, and you take a small number and you raise it to a big power, you're going to get an even smaller number. Um, and so in general, we need a contribution from all values of n. Um, but if we just focus on small r, then it's OK just to take n equals 1 to get a decent approximation. right? So I'm going to say, um, let's say that r is small. Uh, then we can say that the potential 
is approximately um, some coefficient which would be alpha 1. I'm just going to call that a. There's no need to keep the subscript 1 if we're only having one uh, constant. So a r to the power of pi over theta naught and then times sine of pi over theta naught um, times theta uh, and then plus v naught again. And once we have our potential, it's straightforward to go from there to the electric field, right? Because the electric field is just minus the gradient of the potential. Um, let's stick to polar coordinates. Um, and so first, let's get the radial component of the electric field. That just involves differentiating uh, V partially with respect to R. So you're going to get um, A uh, pi over theta naught from differentiating with respect to R then r to the power of pi over theta naught minus 1, just decrease the power by 1, and your sine term is unchanged, so sine of pi over theta naught theta, that's in the r direction. Then I stick a minus sign in front um, because of the minus sign in the definition of how electric field is related to um, potential. Then for the theta component, the angular component, um, you have to differentiate with respect to theta, um, and also divide by r, that's how it works in polar coordinates, right? And so I'm going to get minus a. Um, when I differentiate this sine term with respect to theta, um, I'm going to get cos and also pull a factor of pi over theta naught out. So you again get a pi over theta naught. Uh, your r term is going to be pi over theta naught. You have a minus 1 again because, like I said, you have to divide by r um, when you find the gradient in uh, polar coordinates. Then our sine became a cos, so it's cos of pi over theta naught times theta. That's in the theta direction. And so here is an expression for the electric field uh, approximately um, between the plates, or certainly valid in the region where r is very small. Now, when you've just derived a result like this, it's always good to stop and think about whether it makes physical sense. So let's see if we can make some sense out of the results that we've got here. And I think the easiest way to do that is consider some specific values of theta. Right. So when theta is zero, what happens to the components of the electric field? Well, the radial component disappears because sine of zero is zero. And the angular component, the tangential component, um, is a maximum because cos of zero is one, which is its maximum value. Right. So that's saying that when theta is zero, um, the electric field is purely in the tangential direction. In other words, it's kind of pointing um, away uh, from that bottom plate there which is good because electric fields should always be perpendicular to um, conducting surfaces. What about when theta is equal to theta naught? You get exactly the same thing, um, well, almost the same thing, because when theta is theta naught, you get sine of pi, which is zero. So again, the radial component is zero. The tangential component uh, will again be a maximum, but in the opposite direction, right? Because cos of pi is minus one, and so your electric field lines, when theta is theta zero, would be sort of pointing down um, away from uh, the, uh, the the plate up at the top there. Again, that makes a lot of physical sense. What about exactly halfway between the plates when theta is equal to theta zero over two? Well, the sine term, the radial term, when theta is theta naught over two, you're going to get sine of pi over two. That is a maximum, whereas the cos term Again, you get cos of pi over 2, cos of pi over 2 is 0, and so the electric field is purely radial um, at the plane, uh, sort of the mid plane between the two conducting planes, right? And so that, again, makes physical sense. By symmetry, you've got this line um, at theta naught over 2, like that, along which the electric field always points radial outwards. Like, there would be no reason um, for a charged particle to be attracted to one plane or the other if it were at that mid plane and so it makes physical sense. I won't attempt to do a full sketch of all the field lines um, in this video by hand but I've made a, a properly calculated version of them um, in the thumbnail so have a look at that to see the full solution. So final thing I want to address is what actually is this a term which has appeared in our final result. It's a little bit strange right because it's just a parameter that's kind of appeared out of nowhere. It wasn't in the problem statement so it's a little bit strange that we've ended up with this thing in our final result. So the reason for this is actually that the boundary conditions that I specified at the beginning 
were not a complete set of boundary conditions. If you wanted a complete set of boundary conditions, you would need to specify one other piece of information. For example, maybe at some uh, distant radius far away from the place where the plates intersect, um, you have another conducting surface uh, in like an arc shape, and maybe you've specified the potential um, along that arc shape. That would allow you to fix the value of the constant a. I think one way to interpret why this is the case is that in reality you can't actually have infinitely big conducting plates, right? So we've actually posed a problem which can't exist in the real world. In the real world there would have to be something beyond this system, right? At some point, no matter how far away it is from the place where the plates intersect, um, there would be something else out in the rest of the world that provides an additional boundary condition um, for how the electric field um, has to behave. And also note that there's nothing that says whether it has to be positive or negative, right? That A value. Um, and so I've drawn my electric field arrows in the diagram there pointing uh, away from the plates, which is kind of assuming that A is negative. Um, but A could be positive, in which case all of the arrows I've drawn would be pointing the opposite way. And again, that would just depend on what else you have in your system um, further out at large values of R. So anyway, that's all for this video. Hope it's been interesting to see this slightly unconventional method. It's something that I was inspired to do after I uh, read about something similar in the Feynman lectures. I wanted to work through all the, the details um, for myself. If there's anyone out there who would like to see me do this, um, more formally by directly solving Laplace's equation, either because you're not fully convinced that this works or because you would just like to see how to do it in an alternative way, feel free to let me know um, and I can go through that other method as well. But anyway, see you again soon for some more interesting physics problems.